How do your emotions influence your decisions? Many people believe that cognition and emotion are separate, that we make our best decisions when we logically and unemotionally think through the options. Yet in reality, that is a false dichotomy. When it comes to decision-making, you can't separate reason and passion. In psychology, an economic decision is one that involves valuation of options, often in monetary terms. For example, I might offer you $10 now or $100 a year from now and ask you to choose between the two. But value-based decisions do not always involve monetary valuation. Perhaps I offer you either a free hand massage or a free head massage. While there are no price tags, you'll still choose based on how much you value one option over the other, whatever your reasons may be. Some would say that the rational economic decision is the one that maximizes monetary gain and that any deviation from that means that your decision is irrational. Therefore, if your emotions lead you to choose $10 now instead of $100 a year from now, then you're acting irrationally. But that's incorrect. We can really only say that a decision is irrational if it's logically inconsistent with the individual's goals. If your highest valued goal is to buy a movie ticket, then taking the $10 now might be more rational than waiting for $100 a year from now. Whether that's the wisest financial goal is irrelevant. Additionally, saying that emotional decisions are irrational is completely nonsensical. After all, if you do choose $100 a year from now, what's motivating you to take that wise decision? Probably something like how much better it will feel to get $100 compared to $10. Economic decisions always involve emotions. But how do specific emotions like sadness, disgust, fear, gratitude, and joy influence our decisions? How do we regulate our emotions to make better economic decisions? To answer these questions, I'll be relying heavily on a chapter from the fourth edition of the Handbook of Emotions titled Affect in Economic Decision-Making by Carolina Lempert and Elizabeth Phelps. By the way, I'm Andrew and this is Sense of Mind. If you like neuroscience and psychology, please make sure to like and subscribe and sign up for our weekly newsletter. Also check out my bi-monthly live stream podcast with Taylor Guthrie. He's the host of the channel, The Cellular Republic. Definitely check out his channel if you haven't already. So let's now begin with how sadness influences economic decisions. Say I just gifted you a pair of high-end headphones and I ask you what price you would sell them for. Or instead, let's say I just show them to you and ask you how much you'd pay for them. While I can't predict the exact amounts, it's likely that you would exhibit the endowment effect. When you own the headphones, you would set a higher price than when you're merely appraising their value without owning them. Now, let's restart all this and say I make you really sad by showing you a depressing documentary about the tragedies of war. Then I do the same thing with the headphones. I either gift them to you and ask what your sell price is, or simply show them to you and ask you what you pay for them. Amazingly, you would probably show a reverse endowment effect. You would likely be willing to sell them at a lower price than you would buy them. Jennifer Lerner and colleagues in a 2004 study explained this result by suggesting that sadness makes us unhappy with our current situation in a general sense, such that we want to change it however we can. So if you're feeling sad and you don't yet own something, you'll be more eager to buy it so as to change your situation and hopefully cheer yourself up. Conversely, if you're sad but you do already own it, then you'll still want to change your situation, but in this case by selling it at a low price. It's as if the grass is always greener on the other side. Other studies have found that sadness makes subjects more impatient, more willing to take high risk slash high reward opportunities, and more likely to reject unfair offers. Yet while sadness makes us see our situation as, well, sad, and therefore to make ourselves feel better by either getting rid of something we have or buying something we don't, disgust influences economic decisions differently. How disgust influences economic decisions. Now, when it comes to both eating and ethics, disgust is about expelling the disgusting substance, in the case of eating, or expelling the disgusting person or situation in the case of ethics. So let's say I make you really grossed out by, for example, showing you a video of someone eating a pile of worms. Now, once again, we do the headphones rigmarole. 
I give them to you and ask you your selling price or just show them to you and ask you your buying price. In this case, you'd likely reduce both your buying and selling prices compared to a non-emotional condition where I play a video of say a fish swim. But why should that be? As learner and colleagues note, disgust is about quote, being too close to an indigestible object or idea. So it increases our tendency to expel current objects and avoid taking in anything new, end quote. In contrast to sadness, which makes us feel like the grass is always greener on the other side, disgust makes us feel like all of the grass is diseased and should be avoided at all costs. Other studies show that when disgusted, people will opt to switch out one package of goods for another, even when they don't know what's in either package. Okay, before we get to the positive emotions, let's take a look at how fear and anxiety influence economic decisions. Fear is all about getting away from a threat or source of danger. When you're afraid, you want to escape and avoid some specific thing that might harm you. Anxiety, on the other hand, is like a more general state of fear. As the American Psychological Association puts it, anxiety is, quote, an emotion characterized by apprehension and somatic symptoms of tension in which an individual anticipates impending danger, catastrophe, or misfortune, end quote. It makes sense then that fear and anxiety make us less likely to make risky decisions, especially when those decisions involve money, at least according to a 2020 meta-analysis. Now that study found that fear and anxiety tend to make us increase our estimates of how risky such a decision is. So if you're feeling fearful or anxious, you may tend to choose the safer, lower risk, and likely lower reward option when given the choice. You might, for example, choose to put money into a savings account instead of investing it in a startup business. Okay, so sadness makes it appear that the grass is always greener. Disgust makes the grass appear diseased no matter where it is. And fear makes it look like the lawn is filled with poisonous snakes and wasps. All right, I know I'm stretching this analogy, but with that lovely picture in mind, let's turn to the positive emotions, starting with how gratitude influences economic decisions. Gratitude is defined by the APA as, quote, a sense of thankfulness and happiness in response to receiving a gift, either a tangible benefit, for example, a present or favor by someone or a fortunate happenstance, for example, a beautiful day. Like other emotions, we each have a natural disposition toward gratitude, called trait gratitude, as opposed to induced gratitude, which is a short-lived feeling brought on by, for example, listing things you're thankful for. A 2020 study found that both trait and induced gratitude lead to being more risk-averse in decision-making. Perhaps because being grateful means that you're satisfied with your situation and don't need to take risks to change it. Yet, somewhat contradictorily, a 2017 study found that induced gratitude made people more likely to entrust money to a stranger, which those authors interpreted as increased trust. A 2021 study found that higher trait gratitude, but not induced gratitude, was associated with accepting more unfair offers in an economic game where one person decides how to split a sum of money and the other person decides to accept or reject the offer. Now, just to be clear, in that game, if you want to maximize your return, it's almost always better to take any offer you can get. So accepting the unfair offers is not a bad thing. Another 2017 study found that higher trait gratitude was associated with more generous charity donations and greater trust in an experimental setting. A 2014 study found that induced gratitude made people more willing to wait longer periods for larger sums of money. It appears that gratitude may make us more patient, trusting, and generous, but also more risk averse. Using our lawn analogy, it's as if our own grass is always greener when we feel gratitude. Next, let's look at how happiness influences economic decisions. Happiness is for many people the ultimate goal in life, and it's characterized by joy, satisfaction, gladness, and well being. When it comes to economic decisions, just as we separated gratitude into trait and induced gratitude, we can separate happiness into short and long term. Short term is basically induced happiness, where subjects are, for example, shown videos designed to alter their momentary happiness, after which they're questioned to measure how well the video actually changed their emotional state. Long term happiness, on the other hand, is essentially life satisfaction, and it's assessed with 
questions on questionnaires like, how happy are you these days? According to a 2017 review by the behavioral economist Tom Lane, short-term, that is induced happiness, makes us more patient when waiting for monetary rewards. So like gratitude, feeling happy seems to make us more willing to delay gratification to wait for larger amounts of money later rather than smaller amounts sooner. Short-term happiness also seems to increase confidence. So feeling happy may make us think that positive events are more likely to occur. Yet as Lane notes, that increased confidence doesn't necessarily make us take more risks, which he suggests may be due to another finding, that people are more risk averse when they're in a good mood. So while happiness makes us more confident, it may also reduce risk taking. Interestingly, Lane shows that selfishness leads to unhappiness, whereas generosity seems to promote happiness. Similarly, trusting people seems to increase our happiness. Yet, whether the causality also goes in reverse, that is whether happiness increases trust and generosity, is unknown. Okay, let's turn to how we might make better economic decisions by regulating our emotions. Emotions are not the enemy of reason. They're part of the equation in any kind of economic decision. Still, certain emotions are better than others at helping you achieve your financial goals. Therefore, it's important to understand how to regulate your emotions to make wiser financial decisions. One form of emotional regulation is called reappraisal. And this means deliberately changing your thoughts about a situation in order to change how you feel about it, also known as reframing. For example, people tend to exhibit loss aversion. When we lose $100, it hurts more than how good it feels to gain $100. We hate losing more than we like winning. That leads us to doing silly things, like selling our entire stock portfolio when there's a temporary decline in the market. Because when we wait out the downturn, we tend to be better off in the long run. In this context, our level of loss aversion depends on whether we view each loss on its own or if we see them as part of our entire portfolio. If we consider the whole portfolio where an individual loss is but one negative data point rather than its own phenomenon, then loss aversion decreases. Now, there are many other examples where subjects make decisions that maximize their economic return after they reappraise the situation and, for example, give someone the benefit of the doubt when they seem to be acting unfairly. In general, happiness and gratitude make us more patient in delaying gratification. Fear makes all but the least risky and therefore least rewarding outcomes appear threatening. Sadness makes us want to change our situation, leading us to buy or sell at disadvantageous prices. Disgust makes us want to sell what we've got, even if the price is too low, or simply not buy something, even if the price is good. Therefore, it seems that cultivating positive emotions like gratitude and happiness as well as employing cognitive reappraisal to see the situation more objectively and holistically makes us wiser decision makers. Okay, that is it. Thank you so much for watching or listening to this episode of Sense of Mind. Please be sure to like and subscribe to this channel or give the podcast a five-star rating on whatever platform you use. And finally, check out our weekly newsletter by following the link in the captions or by going to senseofmindshow.com slash newsletter. This channel is brought to you by the Diamond Mind Foundation. This episode was written and produced by me, Andrew Cooper Sansom. Thank you so much for watching. I'll catch you next time.